Well, here's a good cartoon. It says, statisticians are jerks. Sonny, see that kid in the dark corner? Yes. Reject him. Ah, oh, it's cold business statistics. And we shall get on to the errors. So, uh, first of all, let's revisit type 1 errors in alpha, which is rejecting a true null hypothesis. Remember, the probability of rejecting H0 when it is true is written as the alpha. And that represents, here I'm showing a one tail upper, uh, upper tail test. And that's what we'll be using for most of this lesson, just to get the ideas. All right. This also works for two tail tests and one tail lower tail tests. All right. So first of all, remember that you were setting the alpha, or maybe the problem is setting the alpha, but the alpha is kind of arbitrary. Once you set that alpha, that's the cutoff point where you say anything beyond uh, this window is unlikely, so I'm going to reject the null. But remember, we don't set our confidence interval or our level for 100% because then it would be meaningless. So alpha is always going to take a bite out of our actual possible values, all right? Secondly, if you have a large n, a large sample size, small deviations, what happens is this curve will tighten up. And even if you have a small deviation, which you don't consider truly significant, it can still trigger a statistically significant result, all right? Now, if you have a small n, you might have large deviations. And the reason they won't trigger a statistically significant result is it's going to increase the spread and push alpha away. All right, so let's go ahead. I got this cool manipulative for looking at type 1 error in alpha. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at alpha again on the normal distribution. What is alpha? Alpha is the level that we say, hey, if the probability is this much or lower, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis and say that uh, the alternative is the way we're going. All right, so it also represents the probability that we're going to make a type 1 error because if you look at the spread for our null hypothesis, we think the mean is 7, then if we're going to have an alpha level of 0.07, then 7% of the time, even when this curve is true, we're going to reject it, all right? And you can see when I change the rejection level, the alpha level, I don't really change the curve. All I'm changing is the probability that I will reject the null hypothesis, all right? Now, standard deviation can increase or decrease. The error won't change. All that will change is the spread for where I'm making the null hypothesis. And you could think of it as changing the confidence interval as well. So as the standard, now what would make the standard deviation go smaller? Well, if I had a bigger sample size. All right. So that's the case for type 1 error where the null hypothesis is true. Okay, so now uh, let's go ahead where the null hypothesis is false, or basically type 2 errors. So the probability of failing to reject H0 when it's false is written as beta. So that would be, say, we said we hypothesize this, but truth is way over here. Now this cutoff point, recall, is set by your alpha. So that point is determined here. And this is the instance where you might reject it, all right? Now, the good news is we don't calculate beta because we don't know the parameter. We don't know the curve, so you're off the hook for that one. And it changes depending on what you set for this incorrect parameter if H0 is false, okay? So beta can change depending on what P0 is, okay? And remember that alpha and beta are not really going to occur at the same time. This in the sense that you're not going to have type 1 error and type 2 error at the same time. Yes, you are using an alpha, but you're not really going to make a type 1 error if H0 is false. I mean, you're not, yeah, if H0 is false, you can't make a type 1 error because you're down on this curve instead of this curve. 
All right, now one thing I wanted to point out, this is where we left off before, and here I'm actually looking at the distribution of means, so let's not worry too much about that, that we haven't done a hypothesis test on that. The main point I have here is see this B, that's determined by wherever you set your alpha level. All right, so if I set a really high alpha level, I wouldn't recommend setting it at 0.52, that wouldn't mean much. And notice I'm doing a one tail, upper tail. Um, that moves this line and it sets the cutoff value for where I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. If I'm doing proportion, which we have been doing, instead of integer values down here, we would have percentages of one. All right, so then the question comes up. This is assuming that the null hypothesis is true and that this distribution is pretty good. All right, but what if it's false? That means this is not really my distribution. Maybe this is my distribution. Maybe my mean is at 9.4. Now you notice that this line right here, the line of rejection hasn't changed because I really don't have this piece of the puzzle, which is part of the reason we don't make you calculate um, the percentage of type 2 error. So what is type 2 error? Uh, type 2 error is if this curve is the truth, but you don't reject the null. Remember, this is the line we set. When we're to the right of it in this test, we reject the null. When we're to the left of it, we accept the null. Type 2 error is when you fail to reject, oh, I shouldn't say we accept the null. Type 2 error is when you fail to reject the null when it's not true so that this is your actual population here. Okay, now this shaded area in the right, you notice that I have it labeled there, it's called power. And power means that um, basically it's how good your test is at confirming that your null is untrue. All right, so that your null is false. Okay, so the further, one nice thing is the further away that your mean is from your hypothesized mean, the greater the power of the test. The closer the two values are together, so if I go like they're both 7, the power gets a lot smaller. Remember the red area is the power. And the probability of a type 2 error becomes very high. All right, so of course, if it was exactly the same, then it wouldn't matter. Um, so anyways, power is improved the further apart the two are. So I think I had it right. We'll leave it right there. All right. So in this case, there's another way you can help with the power. If um, I can make the power worse by having a higher standard deviation. Why would my standard deviation be higher? because I had a smaller sample size. So you can see how small that power is right there, okay? And then they're doing a value here, it's like 80%. So this is like 80% of the curve. Good news, you don't have to calculate that. But as I go to larger and larger sample sizes, what happens is my standard deviation tightens up and my power becomes a bigger and bigger portion of the curve, all right? So really, um, you can't really make the population mean be further away. You don't have that control. But what you can do is take larger sample sizes to minimize that blue area. All right. So again, the this is power. This is beta. These two have to add up to 100%. And then if it's true, that's type 1 error. The actual truth is here we accidentally reject the truth. This is type 2 error. The truth is not over here, it's over to the right, and we fail to reject the hypothesis, and we don't realize the truth. Okay, so let's take some a look at some examples for power. Again, power is when it's easier to detect when the null hypothesis is false, all right? So normally our null for a new running shoe is it behave exactly the same way as your old running shoe. Well, if the running shoe helps you run 5% faster than your old shoe, 
you might be able to detect the improvement in performance. But if by some magical power it showed that you could run twice as fast as your old shoe, that's a lot easier to see. So the bigger the difference between the parameter and P0, the more power in the test. Too bad we can't control the parameter. So, which is easier to, te uh, to detect one out of four boxes having an explosive powder? So you remember us talking about this example. Well, an explosive sensor that works 50% of the time or one that works 80% of the time? Well, I think you would probably be able to detect both of them, but the 80% would definitely be easier to detect. There's more power in determining an 80% accurate sensor compared to a 50% accurate sensor. We can increase power also by relaxing our alpha. That means letting it get higher, but then that increases our type 1 error not the ideal situation. We can also increase our power by increasing spread be between P and P naught. Not the actual absolute spread, but with a larger sample size, those curves are going to tighten up. And so you're going to have less overlap. Really, the better way to say it is by decreasing the overlap between P and P naught, as you can see in this next picture. So here we have one sample size and look how much overlap we have here. As we go to a smaller sample size, the amount of overlap between the two curves decreases, meaning we have both more power and um, without hurting our alpha, our type 1 error. So what can go wrong? Do not interpret the p-value as the probability that the null hypothesis is true. It's the probability you would see the data you saw given that the null hypothesis is true. So in other words, if it's different, it means that normal variation could account for it. All right? So that's the probability that normal variation would explain the data you saw given that the null is true. It's not the probability that the null is true given the data you saw. I know it's tempting. Don't believe too strongly in arbitrary alpha levels. There's actually a book out there about um, using, uh, what is it called, alpha levels and p-values, relying on them too severely and not actually looking at your data and looking at pictures. This You don't want to go through statistics just punching things in calculators and not making sure it's right. There have been professional statisticians making errors because they rely too strongly on arbitrary alpha levels. And don't mix up practical and statistical significance because statistical, statistical significance is as arbitrary as your alpha because that's what determines if something is statistically significant. And yes, you can still make the wrong decision even when you're very careful, which will drive some of you nuts. We live with uncertainty in statistics.